Hey everybody, so I am going to try to play a quick TSR mini game called Revolt on Antares. And this is actually one of my favorite mini games. Uh, it came out, I want to say, in 1981. So who remembers where they were at in 1981? But basically the game takes place on a planet which is on the kind of the outer fringe of uh, the Terran colonies from earth and there's turmoil on earth now and so the planet is kind of in a period of trying to revolt against the terran empire which is represented by these brown counters now each color represents a different house that has some control on the planet meaning they control the uh territories that they have now i have one playthrough i did uh, where I played basically the rebel houses against Terra. In this playthrough, we are going to be playing an invasion called the Silica Invasion. These are the Silica. They are going to come onto the board. And certain houses are going to be allied with the aliens. And certain houses are going to be allied with the Terrans. Now, the game basically works where you have leader counters, troop counters mercenaries and artifacts and so if we take a quick look at the rule book you can see the troop counters where it says jump troop have two numbers the first is their combat the other is their movement the artifacts are special weapons which you know can affect the game which we will talk about when they come into play the galactic heroes will be recruited throughout the game to help one side or the other and then each house has a leader. This is Miros, the leader of the natives. And he has a combat factor and a movement factor. So that's pretty much all you need to know as far as memorizing or knowing how things work. From that point, you will move counters. There will be combat. In this uh, scenario, the Silicon Invasion, whoever has the most victory points after 10 turns will win the game. Uh... Now, each turn typically consists of, and it's a little different in this one, but each turn typically consists of the Rebel player moves, the Terran player moves, the Rebel player, uh, well, the Rebel player moves, does his combat, the Terran player moves, does his combat, the Rebel player then replaces his troops, Terran player does, each side gets a number of recruitment or replacement points. Which the Terrans in this scenario start with 10, the Silica 12, but they will get more because each house has also has replacement points, which is that number right there. And once those are gone, though, there's, they're gone, but it only costs one replacement point to replace any unit. Uh, and then, so at the end of these turns, you can try to recruit a, a galactic hero. You can, there's usually a choose ally, but in this game, everybody starts in play. You don't have to go through allies. And then you replace your troops. So that's just kind of to give you an idea of what's going on. So I have the board set up with the houses. And they start in their initial territory. These dice I have is, is basically a one die roll off. So you take a counter and you will compare... The number of combat factors which is that first number against the other counters combat factors and then each side will roll one die and whoever has the highest number wins and the difference is how many combat factors you have to take off at least you could have to take off more if you can't get an even number and so I've just found little colorful dies to represent each house with the die of their own color so I have to put the silica guys on the map. I'm going to do that. And then I am going to roll to see uh, which ones are allied with whom. Because normally you would simply uh, you would simply take turns picking. But since I'm playing solo, I am going to roll. So we have our Terrans and we have the silica. So the first house we're going to roll for is probably going to be this house, House Fitzgerald. To see which side they ally with. 1 through 3 it is the Silica. And 4 through 6 it is Terra. Oh they're going to ally with Silica. So that is going to be interesting. Because they are very close to the Terran capital. And uh, 
That will be significant because the fighting will begin early. But they bring four for the silica. The next house I'm going to roll for is... Hmm. Let's see here. Well, let's just do uh, Arton and them. And let's see his house. One. So he is also going to be with the silica. He has five replacement points. So... Now that is two, I think there's two of the six houses. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So two of the seven houses. These start, they're going to be allied with the silica. So. I have to roll for the next house because they've already got two. So let's roll over here for this purple house, which is house is that uh, no, I can't read or counter. Let's just roll three. So she is also going to ally with the silica. And they have four replacement points. So the Silica already have three allies. And I think that might be all they're going to get. I think everyone else is, uh, I think that's Berganza. Catherine the Mad Berganza. And each leader actually has their own little special powers which will come into play at different points during the game. All right, so let me just check the rules. Because I want to make sure that uh, that the, whether the houses are even or All right, not. so I'm back, guys. So I cleared up a few things. So I don't know. This seems like a very unbalanced scenario because the aliens start out with an extra house. They start out with the natives on their side. They have more replacement and recruitment points. And they can put their counters anywhere they want. So keeping up with the ruse... The natives and their allies have attacked Starport Emeralds, which is the most VP point in the game. This is worth 10 VPs. So, and this is going to be a V who has the most VPs at the end of 10 turns. Now, obviously, you know, I guess it could fall, but a very crucial development happened when we were, when they were going in for the attack. I went to see what artifact this house had. And it has the field generator. Now, normally if you are in your fortress, right, like they are in Starport Emeralds, all of your counters numbers are doubled. But the field generator basically can cancel that out totally. And not only that, but it gives the stack it is stacked with the same doubling as if it was a fortress. And so for House, I think that's House O'Reilly to have the field generator. That's almost game over right from the beginning. So I'm going to play this out a few turns. But man, I don't really see how they're going to take back Starport Emeralds. Because these guys right now have the Empire has 20. They have 20 uh, combat points in there, which would normally be doubled to 40. But without the field generator, it's just 20. And so these are all the troops that are going to be attacking them, all the ones surrounding them. And basically, if they lose that, meaning if they lose the fortress, they don't have a field generator to get it back. So this is very scary. But we do the combat after movement. The next movement is going to be this house is going to, I'm going to move these their, their troops probably, let me see here somewhere down this way to block any kind of help coming because both of these are allies of the empire so to block them from coming up they're probably going to move troops down there to do that that will be my next move these guys are actually all allies but they don't really have much they can do since there's no the only enemy on this territory is this light green one uh which is uh what barracuda Kenrabi and his tribes. 
this is also uh now i think this one is the aliens so these two are going to have some combat right off the bat but uh yeah this game could actually be over with real quick because normally this is where the game takes place but i will set that play that out and do a few turns and then let you know how it goes okay so i have done all of the invaders movements so i've got a few small combats here which i'm going to do to show you how they go so the first one here these two counters are attacking this counter so they have a total of two plus four is six versus four so there's no special involves so we're going to take a light green die and we are going to take one die for them but they don't get a die a piece you just pick a die so i will just use a red and we will roll these. So the light green gets five to put his total to nine. They get a three. So they have four, five, six, plus three is nine. Five plus four is nine. So that is a no result. Neither side takes any casualties in that one. In this one here, it is four. You have four and six versus three. So let's do that again. This time there is a one and a two. So we come back over here. Three becomes a four. But they have more than enough to deal with that. So they have four, five, six plus another two is eight. So they need to remove four. And then obviously it's the only one they can remove. So this would come off the board the first casualties fall for the empire so these guys here i don't know if i moved them but i think they can do a combat here if you want with the light blue versus him which would be a two versus a three so we will see just throw it up and see how it goes So the green becomes a nine and the two becomes a three. So this one is actually destroyed. So that is a casualty for, that becomes a casualty for the invaders. So I just want to show you guys that I got a few more I'm going to do. And then I will be back to show you the state of the board okay guys i'm gonna give you an update on what has taken place so as i suspected the capital did fall these guys basically i didn't even have to roll a die they had so much combat factors that uh everything in there was wiped out which was all of these counters now they are not allowed to move in after they take it and i did check the rules for that so that pretty much ended their turn i think there was another minor combat somewhere but that ended the invader the aliens turn so now the allied houses or the empire houses are here here this is a uh, khan nirep khan he has a power of precognition which means he can roll two dice instead of one in combat and he can pick the best of them this is uh catherine the Mad Berganza, who has a powerful plus six lightning she can add, but there's a chance she might strike her own stack when she does that. This is Barracuda, who has the power to teleport any one unit of his side anywhere else on the map. So knowing that, what I did was Barracuda teleported a super tank into the enemy's capital because they vacated it to take the field generator over here to cancel out their fortress in the meantime this ufo which acts as a fighter jet squadron which was with khan khan sent it flying over the map because jets can fly over land and other counters and landed it right back at the capital so next turn they're either going to have to fight it or they're going to have to fight this so they can't use the field generator in both spots 
In the meantime, Catherine has started moving here. She is going to attack this unit, probably destroy it, and then start pushing this way to make this gap stay open that Artan was trying to close. She wants to keep that gap open so that they can get, begin to put pressure on House O'Reilly. Hopefully, after that turn, uh, next turn we will begin rolling in the replacement phase to see if these troops come back come on these are just kind of free troops that the empire gets from off planet we can also rebuy these and bring these back on the leader however uh which is serpentine he was defeated in leader combat because if you have two stacks and there's a leader in each stack i mean opposing each other the leaders roll a die and have a combat roll off he was defeated, but he wasn't killed, so he will be able to come back on turn four. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. It looks very bleak right now for the Empire, but they have some very ingenious leaders and allies on their side who may be able to hold, hold things or stabilize things until the Empire can get on its feet. And we will be back to let you know how that works out. Okay, guys, so we are back. We are starting turn two. And I am going to let you guys watch this turn play out just to give you a feel of how the game goes because I've kind of got a better handle on what's going on. But it will give you guys a chance to hear my thinking or whatever I'm how I'm rationalizing things. And then I will go back to the turn by turn movement. But uh, I wanted to give you a chance to see how the game plays. So we are starting with the invaders, the silica, their next turn. And if you want to see their counters, that's kind of what they look like. Now, one of the things I actually uh, noticed in the rules is during the replacement phase, your troops can come back on in your fortress. So once again, Starport Emeros is manned. So what happens is you wind up having to keep attacking this and attacking this until you can get some units in there to occupy it, which is kind of odd because really in this case they wouldn't be able to do that because they have to move then attack then the other side moves then attacks and then they bring on their reinforcements again so they can keep feeding troops in there until they're out of replacement points currently the invaders have 27 replacement points left and the terrans have 17 so there may come a time when the terrans don't have replacement points that's if they decide to use them or spend them. The Terrans also have this kind of off-map force that we will start rolling for at the end of this, I mean, during the replacement phase of this turn to see when they can come on. That's going to be a huge force. Uh, we just need to make sure we have somewhere to bring them onto the map. So I'm going to do the silica moves and things. Uh, I'm not going to probably do a lot of commentary on what I'm doing. I will... I will kind of catch you up on the commentary after I'm done. I'm just going to be talking to myself, so, so to speak. But uh, hopefully you can get a decent view of the map and then see what's going on that way. I kind of zoomed it out just to give you a close-up. But for this, I'm going to leave it there. All right, so I'm going to get started. So the Silica have two problems here. The first is one of their capitals is being held by the enemy. So they got to take that back. You've got Empire forces coming here to relieve the capital. You got Barracuda held up in his fortress. Uh, but this guy has come on who is called, uh, he is actually like an interplanetary assassin named Corvus. So they brought him in during the recruitment. He was one of the, uh, one of the uh, mercenaries that were recruited. The Empire got some mercenaries too, and I will show you those when uh, when they come up. I've already uh, placed them. So, definitely the Terrans are going to attack this again, and they have to leave the field generator here, or else they, they could get wiped out. So, they got to leave that there, which means Fitzgerald has to stay because the field generator has to be attached to a unit. It has no point, so if the unit's that it's with or destroyed, it's destroyed. So, but of course, Fitzgerald doesn't like that his capital is empty because he can't bring any reinforcements in there until he takes that back. 
So this force is going to come here. I mean, they're going to be at a 12 now that they got this cap. These guys are going to break off and come here, which is almost no movement point. But that will make room for these aliens to come and take their place attacking the capital again. So we definitely don't want to lose our overwhelming odds on the capital. So we will uh, keep the rest of them on there. I think this should be enough because it's only one unit. If they lose, they got to take the whole unit off. There is another unit here though that could go in there. So that kind of bothers me. So we need to engage them, which this unit is going to do. This unit is going to start moving. So you pay one extra point to move into difficult terrain, but that's all you pay. So it'd be two, three. And so, but they only have a movement of three. That's as far as they can get. We have a tank, heavy tank here. Oh, I thought that was the capital. I forgot. So the heavy tank is in the capital. These guys are on a, have a, uh, Hovercraft, which can carry two units, so up to eight across any territory. So they are going to go here. They have to catch up with this Braganza because she's going to tear through their forces. So they're going one, let me see where they're at. One, two, three, four. I don't want to leave it so that they can get in circle, which they could. But they do got an engager. How much do they have here? Seven plus five plus two. So they've got about 14. I don't know. They've got to do a holding action, I would think. So they were here. So let's go one, two, three, four, five. And stop here. No. We'll stop there, six. They've got to try to hold her up in order to help the alien forces. Uh, although they might they might take some damage on that one, that fight. Because she has this ability to get uh, add six through lightning, even though it might strike her own forces. Uh, let me see what this strikes them on. I think her forces... So on a roll of one through four, the lightning strikes the enemy, but a five or six, it strikes her own forces. But she doesn't have to use that. But anyway, they're going to go there to try to hold her up to keep her from relieving them. So who else do the uh, aliens have? So the aliens also have these forces and this force here, which is the light blue forces. So they want to assault this capital. The problem is he sits there with double the power and they don't have enough to really deal with him. And when they stop next to him, he then attacks them from inside the fortress. So they're in a bad situation. What is Orsini's power and what artifact does she have? So she has the energy drainer, which what is, I think the energy drainer makes everybody's power too. So it drains power from attacking forces. All counters attacking the stack containing this artifact attack with it too. But it doesn't drain it from defending forces. It says it can only be used when defending. It adds no bonus if attacking. So the energy drainer won't help her attack him. Her power is... Who is she? Messalini fascination there's a 50 percent chance she can force one enemy troop counter not a leader of her choice and an adjacent hex to fight on her side that turn roll a die one through three means success four through six means failure if successful orsini can use the enemy troop counter to attack any enemy stack it is next to or even its own however the control counter is considered to belong to the original owner when taking off losses if it survives, the control counter will no longer be fascinating. So that should help her because she might could take one of these sevens and turn it on him. But I still don't know if they have enough to attack them. Although this guy might try to do a combat because he can try to assassinate Barracuda, which is why he was recruited. So he has eight. He's definitely going to come here, which will force a leader combat. She is going to bring whatever she can here. So that is eight. Well, that's eight movement, but it's only two. This has three. So that's two, three. They have three. So that's two, 
three. This is from an ally, so he can actually move this turn. And so they're at three, they're already stacked at three. This one is not at stacked at three. So they will come in here. She doesn't want to leave her capital empty. She's got the energy drainer and she is at a hovercraft so she can get there. So I don't think that's gonna be enough to take Barracuda's capital, but it will be, you know, we will see if we can weaken them. Now, Dugo is sitting here with no enemies. These are allies. He's got this thing. I mean, he can move his guys around to occupy enemy uh, economic points, which would be for victory points at the end of the game. But it's kind of superfluous at this point because you aren't really going to count those until turn 10. So you really don't move and take victory points until the last turn of the game or the second to last turn at the earliest. What he would rather do is get involved and be able to help his comrades. He has this huge bomb called the Devastator, which basically destroys anything in the hex it's in. And I think anything in the hex around it. So let me see. So the Devastator destroys all life not protected by force shields in a one hex radius. Meaning you can't, if you're in a fortress, it won't work. The hex it is detonated in plus the six hexes around it. It can be used only once per game during the combat phase of the only player and is left on the board to mark the devastated area. Leaders in the area are rolled for as if they have lost a leader combat. Neither side receives victory points for economic hexes that have been devastated, nor can any counter move over or through the devastated area. The devastator and the field generator will cancel each other out. If used against each other, both artifacts will be destroyed without the loss of any other counters. The field generator is what he has, which basically knocks your fortress's force field off. But uh, he has to get this to a hex, so we need to get a hovercraft in here, which he don't. I don't think he has any hovercrafts. So yeah, we need to get an ally to bring a hovercraft over there. So he can bring that somewhere over here. If he could drop that here, it would be huge. So I think I will work on that next turn, trying to get a hovercraft to him. He will put a call in to his allies to come get that. In the meantime, I think he's just going to consolidate his capital. So these guys are going to come back one, two, three. He can go one. Leaders don't count against the stacking, but you can only have three units in a hex, not including the leader. So in this hex, we've got or artifacts. So in this hex, well, unless the artifacts have a combat value, then they do count against the stacking. So right now there's two in here and an artifact with no combat value. So I can put another one in there. So that's three. So his capital will be nice and protected. Uh, although I don't know, I guess I better leave some room to put the hovercraft in there so that it can pick them up next turn. So yeah, you got to do that. So I would leave him out. These are natives, which really have nothing to do, but we will bring them in. They're pretty weak, but, uh, they can hold some territory for you. So they move two. So that's one, two, one, two. So they're actually allied. So I think that is all the movement for the Silica player. Now we do the Silica combat when Silica is already invaders. So now we will do their combat. Let's see, let's do the, let's do this combat first. So he is attacking Braganza stack. He has a total of 12, 13, 14. What is his special ability? Araton. What is Araton's ability? I know what hers is. He has long distance telepathy. When rolling for recruiting galactic heroes, he is successful on a one or two. Well, that didn't even come into play. So his stack is 14. Her stack is five plus six, which is only 11. Wow. So she has to decide if she wants to use her lightning, but it could strike her. Or if she wants to roll against 11 against 14. 
So this is interesting. If she uses her lightning, she would go to 11 plus 6 and it works. She would go up to, uh, well, they would lose 6 points. So they would go from 14 to, what, 8? Yeah, they'd go down to 8. So I don't know if that would be enough to really destroy them. If they, if they win the combat, she might have to get rid of one troop. But then if they she loses the leader combat, because they're going to have to fight a leader combat, she could get destroyed, which would also take out her artifact. It would be out of the game. So I guess she better try to use it. Even if it hits her stack, I don't really see if she's going to be in much of a worst case. So she needs to roll a d6 and on a anything but a one anything but a five or six it hits the enemy and what did she roll she rolled a two so that takes six from their stat so they go to eight she is at 11 so it's eight versus 11 where's my orange die versus dark green all right so they have eight plus five which puts them at 13 she has 11 plus 3, which puts her at 14. So that was huge. So they lost by 1, which means they need to take off 1 point, which they can take off this 2-point hovercraft. But other than that, they get to stay there. So their blocking action is actually working because... Well, she could probably move around them. Like, you don't get stuck in combat. But you, she can't move through them or over them right now. But they are kind of holding that area up. So that wasn't a bad combat for them. Let's do this one next. Or matter of fact, let's do this one here at the Capitol. Uh, no, let's do this one because he's at 12. There's nothing special there. They're at 4 plus another 5 plus another 5. That's 14, 15, 16, 17 versus 12. So this should be interesting. 17 versus 12. So let's see what they got. This is, I think that's one. Yeah, that's a one. So they're at 18 plus 12. 12 plus 5 is 17. Oh, that's basically they just won it. And because he has nothing else to come off, all six has to come off. Wow. Let me make sure that's right. 12 plus 5 is 17, and that's fifth. That's 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 plus 1 is 18. Man. So they will take their capital back, but they can't move in there this turn because they've used up their movement. The movement turn is over with. So that is still empty, and the Empire forces have another troop on their movement phase that can move right in there. So they can keep doing that over and over again, making them having to keep retake that now. Okay. Now we can either do this combat or this combat. Both of them are going to have leader combats. So I think we will do this one first. This is going to be interesting. So the total power in this hex is 8 plus 3 is 11 plus 4 is 15 plus 5 is 20 plus another 5 is 25 double that it's 50 so they are at 50 wow so you compare them to 3 plus 2 is 5 you have another 8 9 10 that's 15 and then you have another seven so basically you have 15 plus 7 22 versus 50 so there's no way they can win but we will we will roll for this to show you how this works what's my purple die well i'll use this as the purple so 50 plus what did i say 27 or whatever 20 so it's 56 versus let me count this again seven that's seven in that stack 
plus another 8, 9, 10, just 17, plus another 5, 6, 7, 17 plus 7 is 24. They wrote a 4. So it's 28 versus 56. So you take 56 minus 28. And they have to move remove 28 points of forces. The problem is they don't have 28 points of forces. So all of these are going to get removed. They're gone. But the leaders have to stay to see whether they die or they fight. I mean, whether they die or not, because they have to fight a combat. Now, uh, since there's more than one leader in here, they can pair off. So I think each leader has to only fight one combat. So since they're the attackers, the Corvus Kid is going to want to fight Barracuda and the, and, uh, What's her name? Messalina is going to fight the NS kid who's like a pilot. Now, Corvus is the only one who gets a bonus to his die roll in combat. He is an assassin. So he gets to add one to his die roll when he fights a leader combat. So that's what he was recruited for to try to kill Barracuda. So Barracuda is going to be rolling his die. He's going to be rolling his. Whoever rolls highest wins. And let's see. Oh, he rolled one plus seven. Barracuda is Barracuda lost. Let's see if he's dead or if he comes back later. Well, I didn't see what that one is. Three. One, two, or three. <coughs> I think he comes back later. Yeah, I think I think I think you do. Or do you need a four? Let's see. Barracuda. So the assassin did his job. He he basically went in there and assassinated. That's which is why they sacrificed all those troops. Oh, one or two. So he will come back in three turns. <clears throat> which in his case will be turn five. So Barracuda is out of the game until turn five. Even though he won. The combat, you can still lose the leader combat. Now, Berganza is going to fight the NS Kid, and they're just basically a basic roll-off. So, give me a white die for the NS Kid, her die. And let's see who won this one. Oh, the NS Kid won. So, she lost. Let's see if she comes back. Four. So, she will come back in... But the fact that she, she got killed, she loses her artifact. This is out of the game permanently. So the energy drainer is gone. She will also return on turn five. But that cost them a whole lot to get Barracuda off the map. But the reason they wanted to get Barracuda off of the map is because he had that teleport ability where he could keep teleporting troops in there. Which he obviously won't be able to do. So this leader is still here. Uh, this leader is still in here. Now this guy can attack him next turn. And uh, I don't really know if he would get killed though. Since he is a leader by his stack by himself. I think he still would have to do the leader combat says dead leaders and destroyed artifact counters may never be replaced so defeated leaders are not simply taken from play like other counters for each defeated leader so so basically if he attacked him the most he could do is either kill him or run him off the board uh as part of the leader combat so it's kind of odd because the leader does have troops with him but because they're a leader you know, you really aren't attacking their troops in a situation like that. But again, now there's one more combat for the Silica to resolve. But they have the Force Generator. So you saw how they were at 50. These guys are not going to get that bonus. So they just have to add up what they have, which is 5 plus 7 is 12. 
plus 3 is 15 plus another 7 is 22. So they have 22. So I'll make a note of that so I don't have to count it again. These guys have, I don't know what they have anymore, but they had 50 something last time. So they have 10, 13. They have another 6, which is 19. And then in this stack, they have 17. So 19 plus 17 is 19, 29 plus 7 is 36. And then let's see what they have in this stack. So there is another 6, 12, 36 plus 12 plus another 4 is 16. 36 plus 16 is 42. Wait, no, 52. 36, yeah, that's 52. So they have 52 versus 22. So there's really no way that stack can win, but we will see what the margin of the loss will be. So they have 52 plus another 2 is 54. They got another 40. They're 22. So it's 26 versus 54. So 54 minus 26 is 28. So they're going to lose 28 points, which is basically the whole stack because it was only 22. But there is a leader in this stack. And there goes another artifact. The UFO artifact is out of the game. So these artifacts go by the wayside pretty quickly when they're put in combat. But this leader, she has to fight Fitzgerald and McGrom. But since they, they can pick... And I will let them decide. Let me see. What is Fitzgerald's ability? See which one wants to fight her. Uh, who is that? Simon Fitzgerald. He has ion ways that raises the fears of troops stacked with him, raising each combat factor by one. So I didn't even do that. So he would have had some more, but it didn't come into play. She is a mercenary emerald. What is her ability? Because I didn't even check hers. So, well, she just commands a tank battalion. So, anyway, I think, I think I'm going to let the alien leader fight her, Magron, because I don't think he has much any kind of uh, ability either. So, if he gets taken out, yeah, he's just the leader of a tank commander. So I will let McGron fight her first. So that would be a white versus a gray. So he is at a one and she rolled a six. Wow. Wow. So McGron is McGron is taking out. So let's see how long he's out of play. One. He is dead. Ho ho ho. So the aliens have lost their leader. He has fallen. McGron, the leader of the alien forces, has fallen. Who's going to take over? I don't know. But the leader of the alien forces has fallen. He is out of the game. A one minute, he does not come back. So, wow, she did her job. Now, because she survived, she has to fight Fitzgerald, whether he wants to fight her or not. So, let's see what happens with these two. Three... Versus a, what did he got? I don't want to touch it. A two. She won. She beat Fitzgerald. So let's see if he comes back. What did he get? A three. So he will be out until turn five. Wow, these mercenaries are good fighters, man. All right, but since he is out and he got killed, the artifact, I think, has to go with him. Well, no, there's still some other troops with it. So they can hold on to the artifact. As I was about to say, if you take that field generator out, it changes everything. But it's still stacked with some troops. So let me check this to make sure, though, because he was the one carrying it. So I don't know if it has to be any troops or if it's the one that's carrying it. So let's just see here to clarify this. 
Artifacts, blah, artifacts with no combat factor are destroyed if the counters they are stacked with are destroyed. So all the counters are not destroyed. But wow, so you can see we got a whole bench of leaders here that are pretty much out of the game, you know, until turn five or six, which is going to be real pivotal because a lot of them are going to be coming back during that turn. But uh, wow. So she actually got to survive, which means she can actually stay in this hex then. Even though she lost the combat because she defeated all the leaders. And I mean, that took a bulk of points out of the game. So this was looking real bad for the Empire to start with. Now it's not looking, not looking as bad. So what I would do next is we will do the Empire's moves and then their combats. But I just wanted to show you guys a full round. I will give you an update later. Hey everybody, so I am back with the conclusion and after a couple of hours I have called the game for the Empire. So believe it or not, the Empire managed to claw its way back and it is now in a position where the Silica and the evading forces and the traitors have no choice of chance of winning. First of all, they are out of replacement points they lost all these units last turn these are empire units that haven't come on but if you look at the strategic situation on the map their siege of the capital has been broken they pretty much spent the whole game up there and the empire was eventually able to push forces through and keep feeding in imperial forces and finally break that hold so you have a you have a force here for the Empire, a force there. These jump troops are holding the capital. This capital the Empire took and has not surrendered from since five turns. These are more Empire troops. Down here, the Empire is here, here, and there. Barracuda tried to come over, but he really is just getting over there. And he just lost some troops. These two are basically holed up in their capitals looking at each other because neither one really has enough power to dislodge the other. Uh, and this is uh, McKenzie's forces and the natives who have basically never left this area. McKenzie did drop the nuke here and devastated all of this area and the troops there. But the Empire had decided to sacrifice some troops there and threaten his capital because they knew he had the nuke and so they wanted to make him use that nuke there instead of bringing it over here on the continent and that might have been a huge decision because now there's nothing really that the uh, invaders have to stop the forces of the empire they lost their leader of the invasion a long time ago and most of their leaders have been off the board they have no more allies or mercenaries that they can recruit and so I have called this game for the Empire because from this point on what would probably happen is the Empire would probably push out and destroy that unit there. Uh, they would then overwhelm this laser tank unit that has the field generator there. And that would pretty much be the end of the game. Because they already hold that capital. They would probably by this turn take Emeralds back and hold it for the rest of the game. And they're really, they're, there's really nothing the Silica and them have to do that can dislodge them after that happens. I tell you, one of the key things to this game is you got to be able to keep feeding troops into your capitals when they fall. Because you get kind of an extra turn during the replacement phase to reinforce your capital. I mean, they do not get a free move after they take all the units and defeat them. At least it's not in the rule book. So because they're sitting there waiting till next turn you can keep feeding units in there unless you have no units to feed in there because all your replacement points are gone which uh that's what i think they were they were betting on is that the replacement points would be gone by now and then they could move in there permanently which probably would have gave them the game uh but the problem is uh the empire didn't run out of replacement points and they've just taken too many losses to attrition now to really be able to do anything. So I hope you guys like that.
Uh, as I said, this is called, this is a pocket game by TSR called Revolt on Antares. Take care. God bless.